Welcome to the sequels branch of the Yun Sid Historical Museum. Our current exhibit focuses on the concert feature to Whale Boogaloo, the long-awaited sequel to Disney's original Magnet Opus. Featuring brilliant classical music, vibrant animation, and Bette Midler, F2K is a veritable smorgasbord of sight and sound that will make you feel like the snootiest of snoots. So sit back, loudly take a sip of your gin and tonic, and enjoy our feature presentation. Yeah, so there's a lot that can be said about the Fantasia duology, the first of which I'd consider Uncle Walt's masterpiece. I do eventually want to write in great, great detail about that film someday. Why am I gonna be focusing on Fantasia 2000 instead? Well, to be perfectly honest, I don't think my writing and media analysis skills are honed enough yet to take on the white whale that is the OG Fantasia. So I'll save that project for later, when I inevitably become the god of film analysis. But for now, I'll provide some brief history for the uninitiated. Once upon a time, Walt Disney was pondering the emerging potential of combining classical music and animation. Seeking to expand his use of music beyond his earlier silly symphony cartoons, Walt and conductor Le Le Leopold began scratching each other's brain itches about the possibilities for a short based on The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Shit quickly expanded to a full feature film, envisioned as a visual musical concert. With a program of animated shorts, accompanied by some of the finest bops that the world of classical music had to offer, Fantasia proved to be a groundbreaking project that displayed a new level of technical sophistication by Disney's artists, and further cemented the legitimacy of 2D animation as a serious dramatic art form for the silver screen. At the time of its completion in 1940, sweet, innocent, wide-eyed Walt had dreams of Fantasia as an ongoing project, wherein a new version of the film would be released every couple of years, each time with a different program mixing already existing segments with new ones. This vision would prove to be worthy of the unrealistic imaginations of the protagonists of Disney's own filmography because the film failed miserably. Not in terms of artistic merit, many a film critic found themselves practically filleting the movie's technical prowess and innovative sound system in the Sunday papers, but an unexpectedly high budget and severely limited distribution made for returns that had the financiers going, <gasps> It's not, not profitable! The line went down! But after a full half a century of re-releases and the success of the VHS, Fantasia finally turned a profit, and Walt's nephew, Roy, was able to persuade the company's new head honcho and actual vampire, Michael Eisner, to greenlight a sequel. So, how'd they do? Did they manage to deftly combine the original's magical spirit with their own inventive ideas to create something special? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's alright. I mean, I respect the shit out of them for what they tried to do, you know, and there's a lot of a praise about this movie. Not only praise, as they sure did falter in a lot of ways, but let's do that. And along the way, I'll present as best I can what I think are the movie's accomplishments and shortcomings, how both combine to make the whole that is Fantasia 2000, why it's something special to me, and why I'd like to see more stuff like it up on that silver screen we call The Movies. So, unfortunately, the well is poisoned rather early on by the readily apparent lack of scope. Fantasia 2000 is one speedy-ass mofo clocking in at a mere 74 minutes. It does have eight sequences, but there are several things to note with that seemingly impressive number. The Sorcerer's Apprentice is reused from the first film, and both the opening number, Beethoven's Fifth, and the Carnival of the Animals each last less than three minutes. Compare this to the original film, wherein every sequence was at least seven minutes long. Only four of the new segments here reach that length. Now, criticizing numbers and run times and other details may seem trivial, but I think it's important stuff to recognize when talking about a movie that is really a feature-length program of numerous short films. It's a perfectly fine choice to include some shorter pieces, length is no inherent measure of quality, but this selection leads to the movie feeling considerably smaller in scale than its predecessor. But the film we have is the film we have, so let's examine what we have. Now there are three kinds of music on this Fantasia program. The opening reintroduces the three types of music Fantasia uses, but despite its inclusion of this third kind of music, what Deans Taylor calls absolute music, there seems to be an emphasis on including some kind of narrative into each segment. 
You can see this right from the start with the narrative of Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 that includes these little triangle butterflies trying to keep out of reach of an enveloping storm cloud and bat-like pursuers. The size of these two fellas gives off a parent and child vibe, trying to stay together during a harrowing experience, and the images of fire bursting from the ground has me thinking about an erupting volcano. Unfortunately, like I mentioned a second ago, the symphony is arranged into a far too brief three minutes, and even though I vibe with these gorgeous-ass waterfalls of light bouncing off the clouds, it goes by much too quickly to ever leave much of an impression. Whereas the Toccato and Fugue, which opened the original, goes on for much longer and allows you to really settle in and go along with the journey it takes you on. The images do suggest some things of their own, but none of them are ever really defined enough to ever get in the way of whatever you might think of. I myself usually think of a traversal through a marshy forest in the small hours of the morning, right before dawn, or other spooky mystical scenes. The Symphony No. 5 just doesn't seem to encourage as much freedom or let you get as lost in it. The music is certainly described as existing simply for its own sake, but trimming down the piece so heavily certainly doesn't let it feel like it's existing for its own sake. Instead, it feels like it's existing for the sake of grabbing the audience's attention as efficiently as possible with a bombastic opening. So, not off to the most auspicious start, but things are gonna get significantly beefed up in the much stronger following sequence. One important thing I really, really, really need to get out of the way here is that Steve Martin mentions this Steve Martin's two-week master musician home study course. More about that later. But he never comes back to talk more about that. Lies! Many Disney films from the late 90s and early 2000s include one or two sequences that I like to call the CGI set pieces. Essentially, a big, lavish scene that demonstrates the artist's developing use of computer animation. Think the ballroom dance in Beauty and the Beast, the introductory tour to Atlantis, or the pirate ship flying through London in Peter Pan 2. Thing I really love about all of these is how they combine both hand-drawn and computer animation, and how the 3D animation is often stylized to blend well with the hand-drawn stuff. Treasure Planet is my favorite example of this style, as basically the entire movie is some hand-drawn characters interacting with other characters who are either a blend of hand-drawn and CG, or all CG, all moving around in deep canvas environments. I can hardly even tell where the 2D ends and the 3D begins. I love it. Yeah, I got your Mr. Mop. Anyway, all that to say is that I don't mind the CGI whales in Pines of Rome. Sure, when they're floating around, they seem to be mostly filled with helium, but their general appearance is in keeping with that 3D that looks like 2D style. I have read a bit about the troubled development of this sequence and how the artists unintentionally ended up having to use a lot more computer animation than they originally planned when shit went sideways with the pencil drawings, but honestly, I'm just not that interested in getting into that. I'll link to some info about it in the description if that kind of shit interests you. Overall, I think the sequence is still pretty lit. Quite literally, in fact, as the glow of the auroras in the starry sky and the hard shadows of the nighttime arctic skate make for some pretty striking images that draw the eye to the contrast between light and shadows. And speaking of contrasts, maybe my eyes aren't that well trained, but the line between what's hand drawn and what's CG is pretty invisible to me when they're moving around. There are only a few shots where the 2D eyes or the computer animation are noticeably awkward. Oh my god, he's coming right at me! But they're few and far between, and the baby whale is still cute as a button. Oh yes, who's a good little flying baby whale? You are! Yes you are! Yes you are! The story follows this little fellow becoming separated from his mama and papa and getting lost inside an ice cave before finding his way back, floating up through this skylight, and joining an entire group of whales as they ascend into the sky in bravest storm, finally arriving in the heavens. Apparently, to make these shots of the whole group of whales moving together, the animators used the same code that was used for the wildebeest stampede in The Lion King. And man, I fucking love learning stuff like that. 
Like earlier, these artists had created this tool for a significant landmark moment in the art of computer animation to make a sequence that felt terrifying and dangerous, and then they returned to that tool for a new sequence that feels joyous and triumphant. When I saw the San Francisco Symphony perform Fantasia in concert, this piece was the one that closed out the second act, and the whale flight, with that brass wailing away, had my jaw on the floor. This is a case where picture and music go together like fine wine and a cheese platter. I'm not a very patriotic fellow, but the way that this piece builds and builds does get me wanting to stand up and salute these here whales. Yes! Yes! Fly! Fly! This is my favorite segment of the film, and I'll try not to get too giddy, but an everything is connected quadtech set during the Great Depression and scored by a Gershwin number? SOLD! Rhapsody in Blue follows four different people as they try to figure out how to escape their currently unfulfilling situations in life. A construction worker who wants to be a jazz drummer, a sad chap who's just trying to find a job, a little girl who's being dragged around to different classes and programs by her stern governess, and a goofy little fellow whose wife would rather he focus on pampering their dog rather than have any fun. Already, the tonally realistic cast and urban setting makes this the most grounded and human segment in the film. You don't see many representations of modern places or people that look like people in Fantasia, so that, along with the Hirschfeld art style, really makes the sequence stand out visually from the rest of the program. You might be noticing the very distinct color scheme for the locations and characters, and the colors of the four protags are all intentional and actually speak to aspects of their personalities. As explained by the art director, Susan Goldberg, Jobless Joe, for instance, is icy blue-green. It's a cool blue with an aura of sadness because this is a guy who needs a job and can't find one. Little Rachel, on the other hand, is a bright color, she's actually a magenta. Duke the Riveter, who wants to be a drummer, is purple because purple has a serious heart and what Duke has most is heart. John is in black because that's the great design color, but his hair, glasses, mustache, and socks are all red. Icy Red is a happy color. It's such perfect visual storytelling, and the synergy extends to the picture's relationship with the music as well. When the music picks up speed or volume, the character's movements respond in kind. When the instruments drop out on a quiet note, so too do the characters resign to their current unhappy positions. But despite the rather bleak setting, this is still, to me, the funniest segment in both Fantasia films. The resolution comes from each individual's rejection of the roles that they'd been pressured to fill, and through each of their actions, they help unintentionally solve each other's problems. The construction worker's eventual decision to leave his job and hustle his ass over to a jazz club leaves an opening in the night shift for the guy who needs a job, and he accidentally yoinks the snobbish wife away from this goofball, freeing him up to go to the jazz club. And in the musician's hurry, he kicks the ball that this little kid is chasing after, inadvertently helping her to reunite with her parents. The thing I really love about it is that what makes this guy happy is having the job that this other guy doesn't want. Kinda shows how it's not the work itself that's inherently undesirable. It's just construction ain't where this fella's heart lies, but there is someone else in the world who'd be happy to do it. This whole ass sequence stands out in the program as a fantastic work of art all on its own. It casts its gaze upon a few incredibly human problems that most people face in life, examines them through the lenses of a fantastic illustrator and composer, and presents a beautiful celebration of how we all impact each other in small ways throughout our daily lives. So, unfortunately, this is where Fantasia 2000 starts to falter for me and never fully gets its ship back together until Firebird. The Steadfast Tin Soldier is satisfactory, I suppose, but it's a satisfactory number that comes right after two amazing ones, and you have to endure a rather patronizing introduction from Bette Midler before you even get to watch it. Now, Salvador Dali, you know, the limp watches guy.
You know, the limp watches guy. Tin Soldier is kind of the worst of the CGI in this film. The plasticky texture is appropriate for the dolls and toys that the segment is focused on, I guess, so it's not even all that bad on its own, but the toys' movements are very stiff and subdued, which unfortunately doesn't suit the music well at all. Shostakovich's Piano Concerto No. 2 has a metric buttload of staccato, which I think would be better accompanied by the quick exaggerated movements that, say, the animals perform in the Dance of the Hour sequence. Even though the whimsical tone of the piece pairs pretty neatly with the fairy tale setting, the sequence just doesn't have a good leg to stand on. <laughs> I guess, though, that this sequence does provide a really strong example of one of the guiding principles from the Fantasia project. Where a film normally has the music come in after the film is completed, Fantasia put the music first and used the visual language of animation to emphasize that music. Regardless of whether the music was an absolute piece that never had anything other than just the music associated with it, or a piece of program music like a symphonic poem, or even something that was somewhere in the middle, the animators had to figure out how they were going to represent the music in their own visual art form. And yeah, that's really all I have to say about this segment, so uh, let's whine about the celebrity host now, I guess. Who wrote this? This film is just over an hour long and features nine different hosts, Jesus Christ. Some of them are perfectly acceptable and would likely do well as the host of the entire movie. In fact, the idea of a whole Fantasia movie hosted by Angela Lansbury, or the certified grade-A badass motherfucker Quincy Jones just tickles me pink. However, they generally lean more into ironic comedy rather than a sincere invitation to embrace the prestige that the first film aimed for. And some of them hardly say anything about the actual sequences or music. What would happen if you gave a yo-yo to a flock of flamingos? I guess some people didn't like the rather dry speaking style of Deems Taylor, the famous music critic who hosted the first film. But unlike some of the hosts here, he doesn't never talk down to the audience. He adds a touch of class and sophistication to the whole shebang as an esteemed music expert who really knows his shit. Even if you don't- <laughs> Even if you don't know anything about classical music, you can still follow along with what he's talking about. And in addition, the info he provides about each piece invites the audience to place the film in a historical context. Consider, for example, his explanation of the history of the Nutcracker Suite. It's a series of dances taken out of a full-length ballet called The Nutcracker that he once composed for the St. Petersburg Opera House. It wasn't much of a success, and nobody performs it nowadays, but I'm pretty sure you'll recognize the music of the suite when you hear it. That bit was intriguing to me because, of course, the Nutcracker is the bread and butter of many dance companies nowadays. Actual nowadays, as in, you know, today. However, it apparently had not been staged in the United States even once by 1940, and I think that the eventual legacy of Fantasia contributed to the Nutcracker's ongoing popularity today. And that is the thing, when I watch Fantasia now, I think about that kind of historical context. The film acknowledges itself as one part of the history of the music that it is using to tell its own stories. There's just not much like that to be found in what the hosts of 2000 have to say. Instead, it's more likely to be Steve Martin joking around or Pendulet yelling at you about stage magic. Slide of hand. Lies! Roger Ebert put it pretty succinctly in his review by saying, The new approach assumes an audience that needs a laugh break after each exhausting foray into the highbrow. Which, again, is the thing, since, as mentioned earlier, Fantasia 2000 usually aims for a much lower brow. But on the more positive side, you do get to see or hear a few of the individual musicians and artists, which helps to spotlight the actual people that comprise an orchestra. And that's pretty neat. And uh, apparently this fellow here is Eric Goldberg. If his last name is ringing any bells, well, that's good. His animating partner and wife, Susan Goldberg, was the Bonnie Lass who I'd quoted earlier during the Rhapsody in Blue section. And when I first found that out, it reminded me of the collaborative nature of cinema as a way of combining the talents of both visual and audio artists, which 
is always a good fact to remember, I guess, so really, as a whole, the approach ain't all rubbish. Carnival of the Animals is one of my favorite pieces of classical music. So you may be able to guess that I think only using two whole minutes of it is a pretty big damn waste. The brevity of this sequence and the broad slapstick of the animation feels so much like the Silly Symphony style that Walt Disney was trying to move beyond by even developing Fantasia in the first place. And, uh, yeah, you know, every frame of this whole thing was, as it turns out, a labor-intensive effort by the aforementioned Goldbergs. And, uh, well, the extensive use of watercolor certainly makes this sequence stand out. Even when the premise for a segment is simplistic, Fantasia 2000 certainly never takes any shortcuts when it comes to the technical craftsmanship. It's just, like, it's impressive. I don't want to sound ungrateful, it's just... I just wish I got to enjoy it for more than two minutes is all. The animation is still dazzling. The musical arrangement is still superb. And the story is still iconic. Though the comparatively less crisp images stand out among the rest of the program, I'm pleased that the filmmakers presented in its original aspect ratio with its original recording, rather than doing any excessive cropping, upscaling, or other nonsense to try to make it match the other sequences. The soundtrack does, however, present a new recording of the piece, which does lend itself well to the album's listening experience. In comparison to the other narratives, Le Prenti Sorcier stands out as a story without a happy ending. The physical comedy and Mickey's exaggerated movements do always have me chortling and slapping my thigh, but even so, it's a story about a young chap whose dangerous experimentation with magics backfires terribly, and the final moments show our protagonist coming to understand the consequences of his recklessness. Even the emotionally honest and down-to-earth Rhapsody in Blue still ended with everything working out alright for everyone. And since that one took place in the Great Depression and still had a happy little conclusion, this sequence also reminds me of the darker edge that Disney would often lean into during its earlier days. The original development actually involved a significant redesign for Mickey so that he'd be a more interesting and expressive character to animate. Most of all, gave him a pear-shaped body rather than just a rigid circle. That pear shape really worked as a malleable, animatable form. So Mickey Mouse now had expressive eyes with pupils, he had the pear-shaped body, which was extremely expressive, and with the acting of the animators, he became as wonderfully expressive as Charlie Chaplin. And that resulting design entailed a lot of what have now become staples of the Disney animation style. I ain't gonna try to specify too much more of what they might have done in this sequence, as I'm not an expert on animation and don't want to accidentally end up talking out of my ass in case I praise the dry brushing in a sequence that didn't have any. <laughs> but I will say that once the brooms multiply and the images start to become more and more abstract in style, the effect is always terrifying to me. Not sure why, maybe it just resembles a large crowd and I usually don't like those. And, uh, yeah, you know, there is a certain irony at play in the stories of both this segment and the following one with Donald Duck. For Donald, things never really worked out. For Mickey, things always worked out. And so, you know, it's sort of funny that Mickey's story ends in disaster while Donald's is a happy ending, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Actually, I'm not, because I'm done talking about this one now. On we go! You know, at first I thought Mickey Mouse could bend the very fabric of space and time, conversing with both Leopold in 1940 and the other composer in 2000. But given that Stokowski can still be seen in the background here, I instead deduce that both Fantasia films take place in a realm where time is not as linear as it is in our reality. This Jeremy Baramy flow of time would certainly go along well with the abstract, undefined nature of the location the hosts inhabit which had actually manifested before our very eyes in the middle of the empty vacuum of space at the beginning of the film. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory! <laughs> it's not even the most impressive thing about this scene, though. The really impressive thing is the animation on this character. 
You know, at first I thought he was the actual conductor, but every time I tried to look up who the conductor was for this film, I just got hit with a this page has become unresponsive window. So my best guess is that the orchestra had no conductor and this was just Disney's first attempt at animating photorealistic humans. They did a pretty good job. Anyway, this segment kind of blows. Noah's Ark, starring Donald Duck, and set to the graduation song, is the kind of pitch I'd come up with as a joke to poke fun at the uncreative producers whose favorite part of working in the film business is having meetings in windowless conference rooms. And apparently that kind of person is exactly who thought of it. Michael Eisner, who, as I mentioned earlier, is an actual vampire, got the idea after attending a graduation ceremony, and then he dangled his checkbook over an open fire until everyone else agreed to include it. Dance of the Hours from the OG Fantasia is also a humorous and lighthearted number featuring anthropomorphic animals. I think this here Noah's Ark segment is trying to do a similar bit of fuckery with highbrow culture by juxtaposing a traditionally sophisticated musical piece against the comical antics of the animal characters, especially since the slapstick really leans into their cartoonish body shapes. But while the animation features some humor and lighthearted moments, they're not directed towards humorous critique of anything specific. The humor that is present instead contributes toward an irreverent tone that unfortunately takes away from any of the majesty that you could wean from the biblical story. So without any overtly religious or spiritual focus like in Bald Mountain and Ave Maria, nor an at least appreciable pairing of music and picture, there's just nothing else that really grabs me. Unfortunately, Noah's Ark is for me the low point of the program. But it is followed by arguably the highest of the highs. Infamously, Igor Stravinsky hated the way that Disney used the Rite of Spring in the first Fantasia. On a purely musical level, he was displeased with the edits and rearrangements that Stokowski and company had made to the ballet itself. But after the release of the film, Stravinsky penned his more philosophical opposition to the very nature of how the music was being used in the film. When Disney used Le Sac de Pritain for Fantasia, he told me, Think of the numbers of people who will now be able to hear your music. Well, the numbers of people who consume music is of interest to somebody like Mr. Sol Hurok, but it is of no interest to me. The mass adds nothing to art. It cannot raise the level, and the artist who aims consciously at mass appeal can do so only by lowering his own level. The soul of each individual who listens to my music is important to me, not the mass feeling of a group. Music cannot be helped by means of an increase in the quantity of listeners, be this increase affected by the films or any other medium. It can be helped only through an increase in the quality of listening, the quality of the individual soul. But I'm gonna go ahead and step in in defense of the masses' relationship with relatively antiquated forms of art like classical music. I would make a philosophical wager that Fantasia's legacy for a lot of individuals has become defined by what the movies mean to their individual souls. I also don't think that the issue of the quantity of listeners versus the quality of their listening has to be a binary either ordeal. In recent years, the accessibility of art exhibited in venues such as opera houses and concert halls has become a more commonly discussed issue. High price tags and the at least occasionally hostile attitude displayed by some people who are already part of the in crowd towards newcomers. While this topic warrants further discussion, it is clear that getting into new art can be challenging for some. And I think the sampler platter of classical music offered in the form of short films in Fantasia and Fantasia 2000 serves as a great entry point for many people who appreciate classical music and they offer representations of what listeners can imagine for themselves when they delve deeper. And so, in my opinion, the approachability of these films can make them a valuable tool in cultivating appreciation for the art of classical music. Anyway, this and Rhapsody in Blue are the strongest sequences of the film by a country mile. And while Rhapsody in Blue is distinctly different from anything else in both Fantasia programs, Firebird would be right at home in the original, 
With its themes of the relationship between life and death, a much more solemn tone than the rambunctious spirit of many of the other segments, and the epic scale of its images. Regardless of the fact that Night on Bald Mountain and Ave Maria was presented as a story about the triumph of good over evil, there has always been the element of the interdependent relationship between those two forces. The idea that without one we would have no relative definition of the other. The choir singing Ave Maria is good because it contrasts with the devil doing devilish deeds in Night on Bald Mountain. And so the pairing pretty clearly conveys the yin and yang relationship of good and evil. And I believe that there is a similar sense of duality in the Firebird sequence, with the spring sprite beginning to create new life in the forest, only for the volcano to respond in kind with total destruction, after which the sprite emerges from despair to usher in an even grander spring. And the sprite first sinks to tear-filled sorrow before realizing the life her tears can bring into the forest. This sequence is more directly about the cyclical nature of seasons and the planet, and I think that focus lends itself well to a reading that recognizes the yin and yang relationships of the seasons, you know? The image of the beauty of life is strengthened by its contrast against the bleakness of death. And so, we come to the end of Fantasia 2000. Hurrah! A rather admirable project with a hefty helping of brilliance that shines pretty brightly amid an otherwise awkward and uneven program. Throughout this vid, I alluded to a bit of the tomfoolery that occurred during production, but the main thing I keep in mind is the general notion that Roy wasn't anywhere near as assured in his vision for the film as Walt was for his. But he seems to have pretty clearly had the best of intentions, and most of the film's highest highs are at least in part thanks to his ideas. A lot of the process of the making of this movie is pretty interesting, but this charming lad named Isaac Carlson already made a pretty good video about the film's development, so I'd highly suggest you watch that as well. Anyways, all in all, Fantasia 2K ain't nowhere near the masterpiece that the original is, but it's also definitely not a failure. Because of its brevity, I'll sometimes watch it right after the original, and the two films when viewed together make for a wonderful double feature. And there are also days when I just throw it on and enjoy it for the nice breezy experience that it is. I certainly prefer the lofty heights of the first film most of the time, but every now and again I just want to kick back for an hour and float through the comparatively lighter fare that this film has to offer. It's still bursting at the seams with creativity. Deft blends of hand-drawn animation and CGI, an all-watercolor sequence, a beautiful remaster of The Sorcerer's Apprentice, and Al Hirschfeld sequence, all packaged together into one program. I talked about what I read into in each sequence and what sort of themes and ideas stood out to me, but the beauty of a program like this is that you can take whatever you want to from each. I actually had the great fortune of seeing Fantasia in concert a while ago when the San Francisco Symphony performed a selection of pieces from both the original film and 2000. They even included Claire de Lune from a segment that would have been included in the original film but was cut to shorten the film's eye-watering length. And just the process of rearranging the order of the different pieces and including one that I had never seen at that point made for a completely different experience. The Firebird was the Act 1 finale before intermission, and Pines of Rome was the Act 2 finale. Gave each piece a different feel with their new placements is what I'm trying to say. I think Disney Plus would actually be the perfect platform to distribute more, but I know that that'll probably never happen. But despite that, the spirit and the creativity of the project does still live on in some Disney and Pixar shorts, like Bao or The Blue Umbrella. And recognizing that is a pretty lit way to engage with media. Identify what it does for you and how it makes you feel, and figure out where else you can find that. It's a pretty simple thing when you put it into words, yeah, but it can be hard to remember. But I appreciate this little movie for reinforcing that. And that, for me, is the magic of Fantasia 2000. I did it! I worked the title of the video into the very end of the video. Yes! Fly, you beautiful whales! 
Live!